Somebody asked me for a scripture, but I guess they're scared to read it. I don't know. That's all right, though. We're glad that everyone is here. If you're visiting with us, we appreciate that very, very much. And hope you come back any time that you get an opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm sure the rain has scared a few off. I know there are a few who are also out of town uh, this morning. So keep all of those individuals in your prayers as well. Have you ever stopped to consider how few men have occupied the position of President of the United States of America. Barack Obama is our 44th President. And if you were to go and try to count how many Presidents are living, there are only a handful, aren't they? There's just not very many people that President Obama can go to and talk to about the struggles and the difficulties and the challenges of trying to carry out the office of President of the United States. But there is another office that has been occupied by even fewer men than the presidency. And my friends, that particular office is the office of an apostle of Jesus Christ. There have only ever been 14 men who ever stood in the position of an apostle. Originally, Jesus chose 12 to be apostles. In Acts the first chapter, the Bible tells us that Judas fell from his trans by his transgression, fell because of his apostleship. And therefore another was to be selected. An individual by the name of Matthias, that made 13 men now, who've held the office. Later on, there was going to be another, a man by the name of the Apostle Paul chosen to fulfill that office. He refers to himself in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 as an apostle born out of due time. He was not one selected as the other apostles were. But yet, he nonetheless fulfilled that particular office. This morning, I want us to turn our attention to one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. He is not one that we talk about very often. He is not one of the renowned, one of the well-known about which we speak and study. But yet, one of the twelve. A man by the name of Matthew. The Bible says that Matthew was the son of Alphaeus, Mark 2, verse 14. He was a Jew, and he was also a Jew of the region of Galilee. He was known by others by the name Levi. He was an individual who occupied a place in the Roman government known as a publican. A publican was a tax collector. A publican was a man who had most of the time purchased that particular position within Rome. He was a man who was hated by most individuals. And he was looked upon as the Jews as a traitor. For he had forsaken Israel and had aligned himself with the Roman government. Oftentimes these individuals were very, very corrupt men. And yet our Lord looks at this individual, calls him to be an apostle, and this man follows Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not only does he follow him, but he occupies the highest position in the body of Christ that a human can partake of, an apostle. What are some of the things that you and I can learn from Matthew? Let's talk about a few. Point number one. Matthew was associated with sin and with evil during a portion of his life. 
We made mention of the fact that the publicans were tax collectors. Rome would hire a man to be a tax collector. He would send him out among the people and this man would collect monies for Rome. And once a year, he had to make an appearance before Rome in order to pay all of those monies that were due the government. But here's what's interesting. Anything that that individual had left over, anything that was extra, the publican got to keep for himself. It became a bonus. It became something additional than his own salary among the Roman Empire. Folks, that kind of a setup would cause individuals to be extremely tempted, would it not? Just think, if you had 20,000 individuals that you were collecting taxes from and you charged each one of them just a dollar extra, you get a $20,000 a year raise. That's tempting, isn't it? But just think, if I could charge $5 extra, now I've got myself a $100,000 raise. Rome's not concerned about the amount of money I bring in other than I bring in enough to pay the taxes to Rome. My friends, these individuals oftentimes were extortioners of the public money. And therefore they were despised and they were hated by all. Many of these individuals were extremely wealthy individuals. They had all the luxuries of life. They had nice, fine, beautiful homes. Some of them would even have servants at their disposal. Wealth surrounded this particular occupation and individuals were willing to buy and pay big money in order to become a public. And I find it interesting over and over in the pages of God's Word, publicans are associated with sinners. Sinners and publicans, Matthew 9, verse 11. And heathen man and a publican, Matthew 18, verse 15. Harlots and publicans, Matthew 21, verse 31. In Scripture even, God tells us that publicans are oftentimes the very lowest of society. These are the sinners. These are the transgressors of the will of God. When I was thinking about these men, two passages came to mind. One was 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. In that particular text, Paul lists ten sins that the Corinthians were guilty of. He begins the list with things like fornication and adultery. In the middle of that list, he talks about individuals that were murderers and homosexuals. And then he ends the list with number 10, and it says this, and extortioners, which shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Folks, individuals who extort money from other people, individuals who charge elaborate premiums, individuals who are getting rich and wealthy at the expense of other individuals and doing it through illegal means, those individuals cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Another passage is Matthew, or Luke chapter 9, verse 24. Jesus is talking. And he says, again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. Here we find Matthew, Levi, a publican. And here is a man who is associated with one of the most vile, evil occupations of that particular day. We have a tendency sometimes to look down upon individuals who were in sin, who were in iniquity, who are violators of the will of God, don't we? But my friends, didn't we all come from a similar background? Oh, we may not have been extortioners. We may not have been individuals who loved money. We may not have been murderers or we may not have been adulterers or idolaters, but every one of us prior to our coming to Jesus Christ, were in our sins and were in our transgressions. Paul writes in Romans 3 verse 9, What then, are we better than they? Talking about we Jews being better than the Gentiles? 
And then he answers the question and says this, Nay, no, no wise. For we have before concluded, both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Romans 6, 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You and I don't need to look down on individuals who are in sin. We do not need to look down upon individuals who are in iniquity. You and I came out of sin as well. Point number two. Matthew left all to follow Jesus. We turn to Mark chapter 2 verse 14 again and listen to what the text says. And as he, that's Jesus, passed by... He saw Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. Isn't that interesting? Folks, he's sitting there carrying out his daily duties and responsibilities. He's there acting as a publican. He is there doing everything that a publican does. He sees him sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said, follow me. And he arose and followed him. You don't get the full picture, however, unless you go into Luke's gospel, chapter 5, verse 28. Listen to what the text says. And he left all and rose and followed him. Wow. He left all. Why does the text say that? He left all. Here was an individual who was leaving a position that was coveted in Rome. A tax collector. Here was a man who, if he ever quit that position, he could never regain that position again. Never. He left all. Here was a man who may have been filling his pocketbook with money. He was a man who had all the luxuries and all the wealth of life to enjoy. He left all, the Bible says. We don't have any indication as to the family of this particular man, but, my friends, we have no indication that any of his family went with him either. What if he did have a family? He left all. Sometimes we don't teach enough about what must be given up in order for an individual to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles, when those individuals followed our Lord, they knew exactly what they were giving up. They gave up businesses. They gave up families. They gave up monetary wealth. They gave up fame. They gave up prestige. Look at the apostle Paul. All that he gave up under Judaism. They gave it all to follow the Christ. Does Jesus ask us to give all? Sure. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9 verse 23. There's a little word that we use oftentimes when we talk about the conversion process or when we talk about after we've sinned coming back to Jesus and it's the word repent and that little word literally means to die. When you and I become Christians, you and I are supposed to crucify ourselves. Not literally, but we put to death that old spiritual man. He's no longer viable. He's no longer living. He dies. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Romans 6, verse 6. We're to give all to our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice secondly, that he left all and followed him. It wasn't a matter of, I just have to give up something and I don't get anything in return, oh no. He was getting much in return, was he not? Think about it, folks. He's following Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's following the Savior of the world. He's following the Master Teacher. He is following the perfect example. He is following the one and only who can give him any hope beyond this world. 
He is following the true shepherd of the Almighty God. Oh yes, he left a lot. But in his following, he gained even more, didn't he? And thirdly, notice that he did it immediately. Still baffles my brain. Matthew had no clue Jesus was going to come by on this particular occasion. He hadn't scheduled an interview with Jesus to sit down and talk to him and be taught by him. The Bible says as he passed by, he sees Levi. And he just speaks two words to him. Follow me. And Levi drops everything immediately and follows Jesus Christ. Oh, if only we could get individuals to be that immediate today. He didn't look at Jesus and say, you know, I really need to go back and talk to my wife about this. He didn't say, well, you know, I've got this position with Rome and I probably need to go to Rome and talk to the authorities about what I need to be, what I need to do in order to be released from my position. He didn't say, let me stop for a minute and let me talk to my supervisor to see whether I should leave or not. Folks, he just got up and he immediately followed Jesus. There have been individuals in churches who have heard the gospel of Christ preached and preached and preached and preached. And they know that there are decisions they need to make. They know that they are lost. They know that if they died in their condition right now, that they would not stand justified before God in the last day. And for some reason, they hold on, and they hold on, and they hold on. Folks, when Jesus calls, and when Jesus says, follow me, immediately an individual needs to turn to the Christ. The question might be asked, why? And there's tons of reasons. One reason is this, because the longer you put it off, the harder your old heart becomes. Every time you know that you need to make a decision and you refuse to do it, there's another layer put upon your heart. And the next time, it gets easier and easier and easier not to respond. Why do it immediately? Because who in their right mind wants to spend one more day, one more hour, one more minute in the service of Satan? I don't know about you, but I want to spend as much time as I possibly can in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the minute you obey, you immediately begin to influence others for good rather than evil the rest of your life. Folks, people need to obey the gospel just as Matthew did immediately when the call comes. Point number three. Here's a man who what? Was associated with evil. Here's a man who now has immediately followed the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is the next thing that happens in Luke's account of his gospel. Luke chapter 5 verse 29. And Levi made him, Jesus, a great feast. Now listen to this. And a great company of publicans and of others came and sat down with them. Wow. Who was it that Levi had associations with? The publicans. What kind of reputation did the publicans have? Folks, they had an evil reputation. Men lost in sin. Always associated with harlots and with other individuals who are transgressors of God's will. And what did Levi do? Levi follows Jesus, makes him a feast, and who shows up? All of his sinful friends. Here's a man seeking to be an influence on other people. We always wonder, how can we influence others? What can we do to preach the gospel? What can we do in order to get individuals to obey the gospel so the church will grow? And we pay huge sums of money for 
programs and for seminars and all of these things. And folks, the reality is there are simple things that we can do just like they did. How many of you know some people who are lost? But everybody does. Work with them. Maybe they're family. Maybe they're just associates in the community. Pick a night of the week. Cook a meal. Invite those individuals into your home. And guess what? Invite two or three Christian couples into your home with you. Everybody likes to eat. Now all of a sudden, here's these individuals who don't know any Christians are associating with Christians. All of a sudden, all these things that they've heard bad about members of the Church of Christ are not true anymore. We're real people. In fact, we're pretty likable people. We're pretty nice people. You can eat with us, carry on a conversation with us, and guess what? We can get along with each other. And you start making associations, and all of a sudden, maybe, maybe we have an opportunity to teach these individuals the gospel of Christ. One individual referred to it as hospitality evangelism. Just think about that. Every family here get together with two other couples. Let's say that's 50 individuals, 50 groups. And every one of us say, this week we're going to invite somebody over who is not a Christian. Maybe a couple of individuals not a Christian. Folks, we've got about 150 to 300 people that are being impacted by us as children of God. Don't we? And all we have to do is fix a meal and invite them over. What's hard about that? But you see, we talk about these simple things, these easy things to do, and yet we refuse to do it. And we wonder, why in the world aren't we growing? Well, that's just ridiculous, preacher. I ain't doing that. Okay. Then quit complaining about the numbers on the board. If we're not going to get out and evangelize, if we're not going to get out and spread the gospel, then we need to quit complaining. Because the only way to spread the gospel is come in touch with those individuals who are lost. And that's exactly what Matthew did on that particular occasion. Point number four. Matthew became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Matthew didn't know much as far as what Jesus needed to teach him, did he? I find it interesting that Jesus is going to call 12 men and he's going to teach them for the next three and a half years what they need to do in order to carry his word to the world. The teachings they are going to experience over those three and a half years are going to be revolutionary. They're going to be life-changing. They're going to be challenging. They're going to be, some of them, extremely difficult. If you don't believe that, just read through the Gospels and see how many times those men are scratching their head about the things that Jesus has to say to them. There are going to be some things that they don't truly understand fully and completely, but they're going to be disciples and they're going to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. Are we... The disciples of Christ, there is no doubt in my mind that we are supposed to be. The word simply means learner. The word simply means one who sits at the feet of another person. And our master, our teacher is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. My friends, this book now contains the teachings of Jesus Christ. If you and I get bored with this, if you and I don't like this, if you and I think it's not necessary anymore, then you and I have ceased to be disciples. This is how we're trained today. Through this book. Paul told Timothy, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13. Go look up the word attendance. It's interesting. Till I come, give attendance to. Here's what it means. To be addicted to. Be addicted to reading, to exhortation. Listen to him, to doctrine. You see, you and I have to be individuals who love the truth of the gospel of Christ. We need to be addicted to God's word. 
Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear unto all. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. My friends, you and I need to become disciples. And you and I need to be addicted to the Word of God and want it badly. So badly that we crave it every day of our lives. And we study and we learn and we study and we learn what God wants us to do just as those 12 men did through the course of their time with Jesus. Another interesting point. Matthew became an apostle. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus goes out into a mountain and he prays all night long. And the Bible says this, And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. Now watch this. And of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Man, that gives me the shivers. And here's the reason it does. What was Jesus looking for in those 12 men? The Bible says that he called unto him his disciples. I don't know how many were gathered on that particular occasion. 50? 100? 200 individuals? I don't know how many were there on that particular occasion. But it also says this. Of them, the disciples, he chose 12. There was something in those 12 men that stood out. There was something in those 12 that caused Jesus to say, I'm going to select you to be my apostle, my chosen ambassador. Wouldn't you have loved to have known what was going on in the mind of Jesus as he called them by name and brought them into that number? The office of an apostle still exists in the church today, but it's still filled by those same men who had it before. But we do have other positions in the church, don't we? We have the position of an elder. We have the position of a deacon. We have the position of a minister, a preacher of the gospel of Christ. We have the position of a teacher within the body of Christ. Folks, there's many positions that are in the church still. And we need individuals to step up and we need individuals who can fulfill those particular offices and those particular positions in the body of Christ. There has to be something special. There has to be something unique. There has to be something different in those individuals to make those individuals say, yes, I want that position. And we see the qualifications, don't we? 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 24 through 26. Qualifications of elders, deacons, teachers, and preachers of the gospel of Christ. Oh yes, how wonderful it would have been to be standing there among all those disciples that day and hear your name. Vic, I want you to be my apostle. Folks, I can't do that anymore. But there are many positions that need fulfilled in the body of Christ and we need men and women to dedicate themselves to training themselves, developing themselves in order to take that particular position in the church today. Next point. Matthew was a missionary, wasn't he? You go back to Matthew the 28th chapter and verse 16, the Bible says that Jesus took his apostles took them into Galilee, and they were there on a mountain. And here's what's interesting. It was the exact same mountain where he had made their selection. And he came and spake unto them, saying, All power hath been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. 
Eleven men were standing there. Eleven men heard those words on that particular occasion. Judas had already killed himself. And Matthew was in that number, and Matthew heard our Lord say, Go into all the world and preach. Question. Do you think Matthew fulfilled his obligation as an apostle? I believe that he did. And it's based on a passage found in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 23. Paul is speaking. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, now listen to this, and which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. When we read the book of Acts, the first half deals with Peter and John, doesn't it? The second half deals with the apostle Paul. Folks, those are just two apostles or three apostles. What about the rest of them? Did they do what they were supposed to do? I believe that they did. Those individuals are represented in the lives of Peter and John and Paul. But they went out spreading the gospel just like the others did. Each one of them had a task to do. Paul says, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. God said, Paul, here's the region. Here's the area I want you to evangelize. Here's the region I want Peter to evangelize. Here's the region I want Matthew to evangelize. And folks, they carried out their obligations to take the gospel to the entirety of the world. Aren't you glad they did? Point number seven. Matthew became an author, didn't he? He just wrote one book, but it's about the life of Jesus Christ. And in that book, he teaches something profound, doesn't he? The theme of the book is this, Jesus, the King of the Jews. He starts in verse 1, showing that Jesus comes from a kingly lineage. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Folks, royal blood is coursing through the veins of Jesus Christ. He springs from the loins of David. And throughout the entirety of the book, Matthew is trying to get the Jews to see, here's your king, here's the anointed one, here's the Messiah, here's the one that we've been looking for. And he uses more prophecy than any of the other gospel writers. Jews, here's what's been written, and here's how Jesus has fulfilled it. Here's your king, he says. I find it interesting, somewhat ironic, that we get to the 27th chapter in verse 37. And Jesus is there upon the cross of Calvary as if he were defeated. And Pontius Pilate hangs a sign above his head. This is the king of the Jews. Folks, Matthew wanted us to understand that we're not waiting for a king. Our king has come, and he now sits on the right hand of the throne of God, ruling and reigning as king of kings and lord of lords. Point number eight. Matthew was a martyr. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us about Matthew's death whatsoever. So the only place that we can find out about it is from tradition. Tradition says that he died a martyr's death in the land of Ethiopia. What did Jesus tell those men? Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Mark 13, 13. He also told them, the servant is not above his Lord. Matthew 10, verse 24. And my friends, most of those men died an evil, cruel death at the hand of adversaries. I want you to think about what we've talked about with regard to Matthew. Here was a man who, as far as Israel was concerned, was a man associated with evil. He was despicable. A man to be hated. And yet our Lord could take a man like that, cause him to follow him, put him in the position of an apostle, 
use him to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then when it came to the end of his death, die for that very cause. Here's what's interesting. There's not a person on the face of the earth today who can't go through that same process. It doesn't matter how wicked and how vile and corrupt you are. My friend, if you'll obey Jesus Christ, if you'll follow Him, He can transform your life. Use it to His glory in the spreading of the gospel of Christ. And yes, you can die faithful in Him with great hope in the hereafter. What a wonderful account we've been given in Matthew. Remember we said that Matthew obeyed immediately. Maybe you need to do that this morning. You've put it off for far too long. You know you need to be immersed into Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Peter told those individuals who wanted to know what to do to be saved, to repent and be baptized, every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Do you need to do that? Maybe you're an erring child of God. You've left the faith for some reason. You need to ask God to forgive you. You need to confess those sins and ask for prayers. Won't you come as together we stand and sing.